Hello, everybody. I am Thomas Meyer, School of Management Associate Professor here at University of San Francisco. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 2001 Gellert Awards reception to celebrate the impact of our businesses have had on our San Francisco community. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items if possible. Number one, stay muted during the session. Number two, keep your videos off and also hide non-video participants so that we can focus on everyone on the screen. Number three, to do that, click on the view button on the top right corner of your Zoom screen and select the hide non-video participants from the list. See the image on the screen here that Sheila is showing to you so you can show your picture. Number four, to see all the speakers side by side on the screen, also click the view and select the gallery. Once we have that out of the way now, folks, it's time to kick off the tasting event. I have the privilege of introducing you to Paula Harrell. She's an inspiring entrepreneur. She has a great real estate background, healthcare, and now the wine industry. She comes from a great generational family legacy that started with her grandmother, passed on to her father, and she's now the next generation uh, woman leader of the family. She's a role model to women in the winemaking industry as a pioneer and certainly a role model to women of color. And as a winemaker, she's acquired quite a palette from the old world countries of Spain and France and brings that forward to a new direction that she wants to in her winemaking in Napa Valley. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Paula. Enjoy the tasting. Thomas, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm so happy to be here this evening and sharing in such an amazing uh, an event that happened today and being able to, to uh, top it off with a wine tasting with all of you this afternoon. Uh, so again, my name is Paula Harrell. I am the founder and the uh, vintner and proprietor of P. Harrell Wines, which I launched back in 2015. So I'm almost six years old. Um, I am a San Francisco native, you know, I was born and raised in San Francisco. And uh, my mother is an immigrant from Panama. My father is American born Air Force man. And they, they raised me and my four siblings um, and a, a series of residential care home facilities around uh, San Francisco. And so I was raised in an entrepreneurial family, so to speak. And I think that the bug really hit me because as I got older and I worked for my dad and these businesses, um, I felt like I always wanted to, to continue this legacy of entrepreneurship. Uh, my father always made it clear to us that, you know, you can can control your, your own destiny better when you have something of your own. And so that's um, something that stuck with me since I was very young. So just telling you a little bit more about myself, I went down to UCLA for college after finishing high school at Mercy High School in San Francisco and studied um, history as my major and Spanish as my minor. So in my third year of college, I, I went to Spain. I did an exchange program and that's when I, got the bug for wine. I fell in love with wine culture and shortly thereafter fell in love with wine and began to explore wine when I came back home. So having Napa right in the backyard, it was really simple for me to do that. Um, but I didn't jump into wine, wine right away. And in fact, I had no um, idea that, what I, that I would ever jump into wine. So I came home and I started to work in um, mental health care and social work, and then moved into working with my dad and helping him with winding down his business and turning it into a property management business where he was leasing out all of his properties and then doing some buying and selling with him. And so I got into real estate very quickly um, with my father and decided to start buying and selling property of my own. And then eventually started to do mortgage loans too, mortgage financing, which I've been doing for 18 years. Uh, but all along I had this passion about wine. So while I was pursuing my career and advancing through my career, I was also um, really expanding my palate, learning about wine, spending every chance I could in Napa, in Sonoma, Healdsburg, Paso Robles, Lodi, Los Olivos, wherever I could go um, so that I could learn as much as I could about wine. And it was just fascinating to me that there were so many different types of varietals of wine. There was so much to learn about it. And to this day, even though I've been in this business for six years, I'll never know everything and I'll learn something new about it every day, which is why it's just so enthralling. Um, so I went through, I didn't ever go through any formal education for um, 
learning about wine that I always like to say to people, I got into this business from wine consumption. That was my education and all of my experience. Uh, and I was lucky to have an uncle who was a wine connoisseur, I would say. He had a cellar at his home and he would invite um, myself and my friends over every couple of weeks and we'd pull out different wines from the cellar or bring different wines for us to all share and, uh, and discuss and talk about each one of them, understand you know, the soil and the terroir and where the wines came from and the differences in all of them. And, uh, and so then he and I would spend a lot of time traveling to different wine countries as well. And one day we were at dinner and uh, he passes me the wine menu as everybody would at this point now for me to choose the wine because we're 10 years in to me having this passion hobby wine thing that I'm doing. And I was selecting different wines and having just tastes of each one so I could decide which one I would like to have. And I was passing them to him and we were like, oh, this is okay, oh, this is okay. And then finally I decided because one thing, if anybody knows, any, knows anything about me, I don't follow the rules very well. So I decided these two wines would be better together. So I blended them at the table. Now that's a no-no, you're not supposed to do that at all, but I couldn't help myself. I blended the two wines and then I didn't show my uncle that I did that, but I passed him the wine and said, what do you think about this one? And he said, this is great. This is perfect. Let's get this one. Just get a bottle of that. And I remember I said to him, well, we can't really get a bottle because I blended two wines. And he looked at me and he was like, but this is really good. You might have a knack for this, but might I suggest you make your own damn wine and stop blending other people's wine? And it was at that moment that I had this sort of light bulb go off where I thought, that's what I'll do in the wine industry. I'll make my own wine. And so that was back in around 2010, I'd say, and uh, maybe a little bit before that. And after that, I went back to everybody I had made relationships with over the years and said, hey, if I wanted to make my own wine, how could I do that? So I did my research for some years and I ended up doing something called custom crushing, which is basically when you can buy your grapes or bulk juice from different wineries and work at their facility or custom crush facility to make your wine. And like I mentioned earlier, I didn't have any formal training in winemaking. So I was able to hire a head winemaker to assist me with making the wines to my specifications so that it was my wine. It wasn't going to be anybody else's wine. And what we've created over the years, they can never resell. So that's how I ended up getting into wine. And it's, you know, I'd love to share this story with people because a lot of people like me would think, you know, it is still a daunting task a little bit to start your own wine business, but it's not impossible. And there's a lot of different options. And I think that is the same for a lot of different industries. There's always another way to get it done. It doesn't have to be one, one way. Um, and it all, doesn't always have to be super cost um, prohibitive. So I think that, you know, what I've done is since then, I continue to educate myself and learn more and more about the process. And of course, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's so much to learn about marketing the business and selling the wine and all of that good stuff and staying relevant. But um, I encourage people, if you're thinking that there's a passion, some sort that you have and you wanna jump for it, but you're concerned that you don't have enough background and information, you certainly can get it started and learn as much as you can along the way. So um, without uh, delaying any further, you should get into what this is all about tonight is some fun wine tasting. And I just wanted to comment, if anybody has any questions, any feedback, if they'd like to say anything at all, I'm completely open to that. Please feel free to um, you know, speak up because uh, I love these things to be interactive. I and mean, that's what it's kind of all about. It's a lot of fun. So I have three wines that I'm sharing with you all tonight. And these are the three wines that I have in my portfolio. I do have two additional ones that I'll be introducing this year, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But the three, the two wines that I started off with were a dry Riesling and also a, a Zin, and then I later introduced a, a Rosé. So first, I'm just going to start with the dry Riesling, and I just thought I'd let you guys take a look at this bottle. Um, it is... A 2019 Dry Riesling, it's from Dry Creek Valley, and it is called H Street. If you recall, just a little while ago, I mentioned I am a San Franciscan. Uh, H, H Street refers to a property that our family owned on, on H Street at 940 H Street. It was um, one of the places where my father and grandmother had a residential care home facility, and they had it built from the ground up the year I was born. And now they've both passed on, but I still have the property, and I'm renting it to another rare uh, residential care home facility operator that my dad trained in the business. So 
just in paying homage to my grandmother and my father and their business legacy and uh, and all that they did for the community, I just thought it would be fitting to uh, to name one of my wines Hate Street. So this is about 13.5% alcohol. Um, it's got, uh, on the nose, it's got aromas of like, oh, I'd say pink grapefruit and lime zest, a little Bosch pear, maybe white flowers that are suggestive of like jasmine and honeysuckle. And on the palate, it's got a little bit of effervescence, some um, lime zest, some lemon tart, uh, grapefruit, more grapefruit, very crisp, very clean, easy drinking wine. Now I like to talk when we're doing tastings, I like to give a little bit of a walkthrough of how you should do tastings. Not to say that people here don't already know how to do that, but I think it's fun to just go through the, the basics of it all. So you want to first look at the color of the wine. And for white wines, they're usually going to be yellow or straw, um, maybe sometimes copper. I would say my Riesling is a little more on the straw colored side. Um, and then you want to swirl it around. And swirling it basically is letting all the aromas come out. It's letting it open up. You're bringing air to the wine so that you can really taste all of the flavors that are in the wine, smell and taste all the flavors in the wine. And so you swirl it. The other thing I would say to, to people sometimes is to take a look at, we call them legs or sometimes we call them tears that come down the side of the glass because that gives you an indication of the viscosity, which also gives you an indication of the alcohol content. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, this one's about 13.5. It's not super high, but it's also not super low. Um, and then after you do that, you want to, of course, taste it. So on the palate, you want to look for things like oiliness, which gives you an idea of the sweetness of the residual sugar in the wine. You want to look for body. So you know how some wines, they are like, you know, nothing's there on your palate. And then other times you feel a little weight, you feel something to it. So you're looking for body, you're looking for sweetness. Um, and, uh, and then you're looking for, you know, tannins, you're looking for acidity when you're tasting wine. These are all things like the tannins will give you like a little bit of burn on the back of your throat. That means that there's definitely some alcohol there and the acidity is more like an astringency in your palate. Um, I like to talk about these things because as you start to you know, people that are already maybe wine connoisseurs and know a lot about wine already, um, this may be sounding kind of redundant, but if people are trying to learn more about wine, these are things that you want to notice so that when you're out looking for wine or you're at a restaurant and you're asking for different types of wine, you can say, oh, I like things that have stronger tannins or that are very acidic or that are acidic and things of that nature. So it helps you get an idea or give the person that you're talking to an idea of what kind of wine you want. Um, this has very little, what we call residual sugar. And um, a lot of Rieslings are very sweet. So I like to make sure people know that this is not a sweet Riesling. It's a dry Riesling and it's uh, reminiscent of the, the Alsatian style of Riesling. So this great Riesling is, uh, is paired with so many different things because it's a very versatile grape. You can pair Riesling with almost anything. I like to say this is a chef's favorite because chefs, love that they have this grape that, that they can pair it with anything and it doesn't fight with any of their foods. However, goes really, really well with spicy foods. So Thai, Vietnamese, Indian, any of those kinds of foods are great with, uh, with this Riesling. And I mentioned earlier that my family's Panamanian. We are West Indian Panamanians and we eat a lot of hot food. We eat pepper, we eat habanero and scotch bonnet and stuff with lots of spices in it. So this goes really well with all of our wine. I mean, I'm sorry, with all of our food. Um, so this is, a, again, the 2019 Dry Riesling. This one has won um, some awards. It won a San Francisco Chronicle Wine Competition Award, a gold, and a double gold with the Orange County Fair Wine Competition. So we are excited to uh, hopefully get some more awards out of this one. And it's being carried at the um, Oracle Center in San Francisco. So make sure if you go to the Oracle Center, you ask for our Riesling. Does anybody have any, if anybody has it, or if not, if they just want to ask any questions or have any feedback about it, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. And maybe I should be looking in the chat. Let me see. Yeah. 
Oh, somebody asked, I love this. Somebody asked, where can we get Panamanian food in the Bay? At my family's house. <laughs> Honestly, I have not found a, a bunch of places that have Panamanian food in the Bay Area. Um, currently, I'm in New York, so we've, there's some places here that we, we found. But uh, we usually just make it at home. So I'm sorry, I don't have any suggestions, but I'd be happy to, to look for some and I can, I can send those out. Again. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm going to move on to... The next one. So the next one we are going to try is my rosé. This rosé is called PJ Rosé. So as you know, my name is Paula. Uh, my middle name is Jean. I'm named after my parents. So my father was Paul and my mother is Jean. My sister gave me the idea to uh, create a rosé and she calls me PJ. So she insisted that I name it PJ Rosé since it was her idea. And since she's my big sister, I had to do what she says. So anyway, so this rosé is actually um, a rosé of Ayanico. I don't know if anybody's heard of this grape before, but it's a South Italy style grape. And then we blended in a little bit of Grenache into it. Um, it's, um, the Ayanico grape is actually kind of a, a very tannic, Great, with a lot of structure and body to it. So it actually carries through to this rosé while still being a very, you know, light creep, uh, light and uh, I'd say soft and juicy rosé. So again, looking at the colors for rosés, pink, salmon, um, things, you know, colors like in that hue, this I would say is more of a salmon color for mine. And uh, the alcohol content is about the same as the Zin, I'm sorry, it's the same as the Riesling. So it's about 13.6. So when you swirl it, you're not particularly going to see a lot of legs and tears, but you might see just a little bit. And then on the nose, I get cranberry and and rhubarb and a little bit of ripe strawberry, um, all that great stuff that you love to smell on a sunny afternoon, right? And on the palate, there's more strawberry, there's a uh, star fruit. Um, yeah, a little more uh, like rhubarb on the palate as well. This Rosé is, so first of all, I have to say, I am a red wine drinker at heart, even though I love white wines, I love rosés, I love everything, I'm a red wine drinker. So people will tell you that they think I make my other wines for red wine drinkers because they're all a little more interesting. They're, this is a more complex rosé, it has layers to it, but it's still light and it goes wonderful with like a, a frise salad that had you know, goat cheese and candied walnuts or a light fish. Um, there's a lot of different things you could pair with this that are just more light in nature, more like appetizers, but it's fantastic by itself. I can't tell you how many of my friends and, uh, and, and family members have just posted a bottle on Facebook saying, was it bad that I just drank this all by myself? Um, but it's, it's a lovely, a lovely rosé to have on an afternoon, a sunny afternoon, but you can also have it, you know, at dinner with, uh, with a light pasta salad or something like that as well. So um, it's versatile, I'd say, as well. Anybody have any questions about the rosé or anything that they'd like to uh, comment on? Does anybody have a favorite type of rosé that they drink? I'm gonna take a look in the chat and see if I see anything in here. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be great with salmon, Becca. You're gonna love it. Okay. I'm gonna to go to our next wine. So the last wine I'm sharing with you today is my Zinfandel. So this is like my, my big boy. Um, I mentioned earlier that I studied in Spain and one of the first wines that I was introduced to was Primitivo, which is the equivalent of a Zinfandel. We just can't use the term Primitivo in the United States. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. It was different from a cab. Back then, Merlots were really big, and they're coming back now, but um, it was different from all of the other grapes that I had, which wasn't that much at that time. I was still very young, but when I came home and I started my exploration of wine, I went in on Zin. So I spent a lot of time in Howell Mountain and um, Atlas Peak and Napa and different places that had Zinfandel, Dry Creek Valley, and I knew that when I decided to make my own wine, the first wine had to be a Zinfandel because I love Zin so much. Um, so this is a Dry Creek Valley. They're all out of Dry Creek Valley, actually. This is 92% Zinfandel and 8% Petit Syrah. So you get on this Zin 
um, you know, sort of a light bouquet of vanilla on the nose and some clove and cinnamon. And then on the palate, you know, that vanilla kind of carries through, but not sweet. Um, this, I would say, is fruit driven, but it's not like a big, heavy, like fruit jammy, um, fruit bomb, I should say. So you get a little bit of um, the hint of sweetness, but it's it's definitely not a sweet wine. It's a dry wine. Um, it's got very well-balanced tannins, tannins uh, and uh, the alcohol level is about 14.9, which is down from my first vintage. When I first made this wine, it was 15.1, so it was a little bit higher. This one's down a little bit. Um, but if you look at the, if you swirl it around and you look at the lace, you'll see a little more definition on the glasses because of the alcohol content. And like I mentioned, aromas of, of vanilla. You actually get some blueberry on the nose here too. Yeah, and you can get that spice. There's like a little bit of a, a tinge in my, twinge in my nose because of the spice from the probably petite Syrah. And, and then just very smooth, a very easy going well balanced. And it's a 2019 vintage, but excuse me, this could actually lay down for 10 years. So it's interesting to maybe get a few bottles and try one now, try one in a couple of years and another one a few years after that, it can last that long. Wine doesn't last that long around me usually so. Uh, but I like to encourage people to try that because it's fun to do that and, and see how it changes over the years. Um, this is called 315. And I wanted to name it Santa Ana after the street that I was raised on in San Francisco. Uh, it was a lovely sort of melting pot of family and friends and and my parents were always sponsoring family members here from Panama. So we had um, a lot of people in our home all the time. And it became all of my friends' homes too. And, and, and so people got married there. I mean, all kinds of things happened on Santa Ana. Lots of wonderful experiences. All of the holidays happened there. We really had a lovely time there. So I just thought in paying tribute again to uh, family, family heritage, um, and just, you know, a place that was so special to so many people that are special to me. I thought it would be fitting to name this wine after that street. Now, I must say that I wanted to name it Santa Ana and it was taken by an Argentinian wine company. So I had to get creative and um, I used the numbers of the house instead. And then I was able to tell the story with the full address on the back of the bottle. So if you ever read the bottle, you'll know exactly what I was talking about when I discussed this. Um, so this wine pairs well with uh, like barbecue and steak and ribs and, um, you know, like a meaty pasta sauce uh, with tomato, you know, tomato sauce. Um, it also would go well mm -hmm. with um, burgers. So it's all of that kind of food that you can have this wine with. But like I said, it drinks well by itself. It doesn't need to be paired. I tried to make sure that my wines weren't wines that had to be paired with food because I just like to have the versatility or have people have the versatility to be able to drink them alone or drink them with food. So you'll find that you have the option to do either with all three of my wines. Um, does anybody have any comments on the Zen or any questions about the Zinfandel? Tasting notes, anything you might want to share? I'm just going to take another look in the chat. Do you produce any 2020 wines? What are you producing for 2021? So the 2020, the Riesling is uh, the new Riesling's 2020. And then for 2021, the Petite Syrah that I blended into my Zin, I'm actually bottling that separately by itself. So I will be creating a Petite Syrah this year. It's in barrel right now. I'm really excited about it. That's like my second favorite wine. And I'll be, producing, uh, I'll be producing that this year. And then we're also going to be producing a Brut Sparkling. So you can look out uh, for that. And Ken, I'm so glad to hear you're enjoying the 315. Um, and Laura, you'll have to try this in for sure. It's, it's really, really phenomenal. And you know, I'm doing something interesting. I took out um, enough for, I'd say it was about 100 cases of Zin, and I produced this 19, but I'm going to do a second 19. I decided to leave in um, about another 300 gallons of Zin in barrel, and I'm going to bottle that again later this year. So the two will be a little bit different, and it'll be very interesting to, uh, to taste the differences in those two wines. So I'm excited about that. You all will have to definitely try that. Um, so somebody said, are there standard terms to describe the taste and smell. I'm always entertained by the descriptive words that people use. Yes and no. There are some standard terms, like you go through um, 
like uh, floral, like turns, like flowers. You do like herbs, you do baking spices and vanilla. There's some standard terms in that regard, but which one in those categories is really up to you. It's what you smell. But I'd say you kind of go through those three different things where you're talking about what you smell in a, in a wide. And same thing for the taste. It, it follows through with the same thing on the taste. So that's a great question, Matt. Um, I'm really definitely one of those people that thinks, you know, there's no right and wrong. Whatever you smell, whatever you taste, whatever you experience is right because that's your experience. And so I don't like to shame people into too many specific categories, but there's definitely the direction that you can give when you say these are the sort of things to look for. So that's a great question, Megan. Does anybody else have any other questions? I'm going to show you guys a quick, um, you guys have this taste or smell. Oh, Becca had another great question. Can you recognize a type of wine just by its taste or smell? So, Sometimes, I'm not, I'm not great, but definitely I could recognize a Riesling. I could recognize a Zin, most likely a Chard, a Cab. Uh, there's a handful of wines that I think, I, oh, a Pinot for sure. I could recognize a Pinot. Um, yeah, I'd say there's probably a good 10 or so that I could probably recognize by its, by its smell for sure. And then even more that I'd recognize by its taste. Because you know, you remember, I was doing a whole lot of consumption before I started. Before I started making wine, I was uh, I was like on a mission to try every possible different type of varietal I, I could, and from different countries and regions. And so uh, that that was sort of my fun little hobby for all these years. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, if not, I think that what I'm going to do really quickly, this wasn't on the, this wasn't on the uh, agenda, but I thought I would just show you guys something very quickly. Um, you know, this was my, when I first started and I was going through an official blending session, like this was one I was allowed to do, not when I was doing something I wasn't supposed to do, but this is when I was blending different um, percentages of Zin and Petit Syrah, and at that time Syrah as well, to try and determine uh, what combination of each I wanted to have for my wine. So this was my very first blending session back in 2013. And then um, just a little note about, this is sort of like one of our, you know, the crushing and pressing machines that we use at the custom crush facility. The grapes come in and they're dumped up here and they go through this pressing a machine so that we can get the first level of juice out of it. And the second one here, it kind of goes through this thing called a punch down. And so we're punching down more of the grapes so we can get more juice out of it. And from there it goes into tank for a few weeks where we're che checking all the levels like the yeast level and the um, alcohol level and the acidity levels and all of that before we stick it into barrel. Paula, I'm gonna interrupt because we can't see the beautiful things you're trying to show us. If you can oh, stop yeah. your screen and reshare and show us the the new okay. page, that would be wonderful. Okay, sure. How about now, Becca? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so this was what I was describing the initial um, blending session that I did here. And this is the machine that we use to receive the grapes and then press them through this, uh, this press here at the bottom juice comes down here, then we move it over here and use this device here. It's a video, but I don't want to bore you guys with this little video, but it's a punch down video that, um, I'm sorry, it's a punch down device that actually extracts more of the juice from the grapes. And then they go into a tank and, and that's where it sits for a few weeks while we test all the levels. And then it goes into barrel where it sits for, you know, anywhere from 10 months to two years or three years, depending on what kind of wine you're putting in there. And then finally, um, we get it out of there and we do this fun, go through the bottle. Let's see if I can turn that down. Uh, from, that, from the barrel, it goes into the bottling um, process line. They bottle all the wine and then they put the corks in and the capsules on and the labels on them. And then at the end of this, you see here's my capsules are on here now. And then when we get to the end of this, they'll stick the labels on there and they'll start to put them into the boxes and voila, there you have your wine. So 
that's them finishing it up and putting on the labels there and sticking them in the box. And then this was like my debut, my first event that I did when I started. And how I mentioned earlier, I just had the Riesling and the, and the Zin when I first started. Um, this is the award that I got for the gold medal for the San Francisco Chronicle Wine Competition. And uh, these are all the wines that we have here today, the Zin, the Dry Riesling, and the Rosé. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And we have a wine club. If people are interested in it, you can definitely check out our website. And uh, we have three different wine club options. So, um, oh, I skipped a picture. This is just in the vineyard where my Riesling is from. Uh, and then that's the last one there. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions or wants to chat a little bit about wine or sip a little wine together, uh, I'd be happy to do all of that. But if, let me look in the chat thread one more time. Uh, let's see. I can't wait to try out the wines. I believe that we did share a discount for conference mm -hmm. attendees um, in advance. And so we can make sure to get that discount code um, to John, and I'm glad you're excited to try out the wines. So thank you all so much for having me tonight. For um, anybody who didn't get a chance to get wine, please make sure to go check out our website and we'll share the code with you so that you can purchase wine. And uh, I hope you guys had a wonderful event and you enjoyed my, my tasting and my presentation today. Paula. <laughs> Paula, thank you. We are so excited uh, to see the wines, to taste the wines, um, and I'm seeing that there's going to be a couple of orders of wine. Um, so again, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, hello, folks. I'm Dr. Monica Hudson, an associate professor and director of USF's Gellert Family Business Center. Um, as part of our efforts to be the premier source of uh, family business and family business uh, research and support in the Bay Area, the center focuses on three major ports. We celebrate exemplary family firms, we support family owned enterprises, and we educate the next generation of family business leaders. Today's award ceremony is designed to address the first issue, uh, celebrating exemplary family firms. Tonight, we recognize our 2019 awardees in the hospitality and general categories, as well as introduce our 2021 awardees. And just so you know, we did not miss anything. Yes, in 2020, we did not seek or select awardees as all of us coped with an international health pandemic. This is why it was so important to us to regroup in 2021 with this recognition and announce the inauguration of a new center program, the Next Generation Institute, which is designed to support our Gellert Center next generation leaders in thriving post pandemic. So please look for more information soon about the NGI. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Father Paul Fitzgerald, President of the University of San Francisco, who will reintroduce our 2019 Gellard awardees. Thank you, Monica. It has been a pleasure to be here today. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. These awards are important because we have uh, been able to lift up important businesses, important business practices, and that spirit of entrepreneurship, which is alive and well in the very resilient business owners and business managers we have celebrated today. We are delighted to have honored Frescas and Jones Protective Services because these are exemplars of what it is to be a, an anchor institution in their neighborhoods. As the owners of Fresca Restaurant Inner, Julio Jose and Ivan Calvo Perez have spent the last 33 years offering their own rendition of delicious and delightful and beautiful Peruvian cuisine, blending traditional cooking methods, authentic ingredients, and a food culture seeped in history in an innovative gastronomic approach, Fresca paved the way for San Francisco's current Peruvian restaurant craze. Customers routinely raved about the restaurant's bottomless mimosas, fantastic customer service, and simply amazing food. 
Congratulations, Fresca. Since its 2004 inception, Jones Protective Services has partnered with its clients to develop effective workable solutions designed to achieve and maintain a safe and secure environment. With his motto, Spirit in Hand, incorporating values about safety, people, integrity, responsibility, innovation, and teamwork, owner Hermann Jones is active in his Bayview Hunters Point community, serving as an engaged member of the local Rotary Club and supporting companies' employees' involvement in neighborhood cleanups and specialized events. Congratulations, Jones Protective Services. So I want to just thank all of you for being here. Uh, thank you for supporting the Gellert Business Family Business Center, uh, which is one of the crown jewels here at the University of San Francisco and a great way for us to be neighbors, to be partners uh, in this wonderful city, which uh, needs all of us cooperating, collaborating, and helping one another uh, as we emerge from the lockdown and the pandemic and revitalize our beautiful, diverse, and United City. Thank you very much for being here. And my congratulations to those we have celebrated and my deep thanks uh, to Dr. Monica Hudson and all of her collaborators in supporting the Gellert Family Business Center. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Charles Moses, Dean of the USF School of Management. Before I introduce our 2021 awardees, I want to take a few minutes to speak about why the Gellert Center plays such an important role in the San Francisco Bay Area. Prior to the pandemic, San Francisco had over 6,000 legacy businesses, companies that have been around for 20 years or more. Think about that. A generation is about 20 years, so most of these businesses were about to transition either to the next generation within the family potentially the company employees, or the owners were just going to potentially end their businesses. Since many of these businesses employed five or fewer people, if even 50% of those businesses had chosen to close, that represented close to 15,000 jobs in San Francisco and its environs. And that was pre-pandemic because now some of those businesses have actually had to close, adding to our region's economic distress. The Gellert's Center is part of USF's efforts to help our region recover. Tonight, we are lifting up examples of exemplary businesses that have survived the pandemic. We hope to help them continue to do so with the services that we provide. So it is my distinct pleasure tonight to introduce two of those businesses. Category number one, Gellert awardee in the hospitality category, Miyako Old Fashioned Ice Cream. As the owner of Miyako Old Fashioned Ice Cream, Tom Bennett has spent the last 30 years offering its own, his own rendition of ice creams from around the world. And if you're like me, you're an ice cream lover. I love ice cream. Blending traditional fruits with all national products, Miyako's authentic ice cream is a major draw to Fillmore Street. We're particularly impressed the USF students, the USF students who studied this business during the fall 2020 semester was that the company's longevity and pride in retaining its small business customer service attitude. Congratulations to Miyako Old Fashioned Ice Cream. Uh, Bridget LeBlanc, LeBlanc is going to accept the award on their behalf. Bridget. Hi, thank you so much. And I am so honored to be receiving this reward uh, for Miyako Ice Cream. I have a really quick story. Um, in 2003, um, Gavin Newsom, who is now the uh, governor of California, was actually running for mayor of San Francisco. And I was his District 5 liaison. So the great news is my office was on Fillmore, uh, the, the corner of Fillmore and Eddy, and Miyako Ice Cream was about a three minute walk from the office. So there was 
I probably visit Miyako <laughs> Ice Cream every time I got stressed about the campaign. Um, one of my favorite ice cream flavors is the uh, bubble gum ice cream. And I also like how he had me reminisce about the candies that he had in the store, like the Now Laters and the Lemon Heads. So, I mean, 2003 and ice cream, and we also won the um, the campaign. Uh, that's that's great history for me. Um, so we have. I'm so honored to be able to receive this award for Miyako Ice Cream. Um, you are definitely a, a community legend, and we are very proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bridget. Um, the next honoree uh, is in the general award category, and that is Mendel's. Since its 1960s inception, Mendel's has been a height neighborhood anchor. Established by husband and wife duo, Mendel and Sarah Herskovitz, under the direction of its third, and now under the direction of its third generation owner, Naomi Silverman, Mendel's focus on, focuses on selling art and craft supplies. Naomi hopes that her son will be interested in taking over the firm someday. Mandel's prides itself on its proactive approach towards generating job opportunities for local residents, as well as its values-driven commitment to community empowered. Congratulations to Mandel's. Good evening. Um, I will be accepting the award on behalf of Mandel's. Um, it was a very sad occasion that Naomi indicated that she was not going to be able to uh, join us uh, this evening. Um, but uh, she is very excited uh, by the award and really um, mentioned how honored she was to be recognized, not just by the university, but by the students who did research on Hate Street uh, this past fall. Um, so we're very um, pleased uh, to accept the award on behalf of Mendel's and hope that she will be able to join us in our physical presentation in September. Thank you all and congratulations to all the honorees. Hello, I'm Leonard Weingarten. I'm the chair of the Gellert Center Advisory Board and I would like to call out my fellow Gellert Advisory Board volunteer members, including Dr. Jennifer kamato Lukey, Regina Davis, Audrey Jones-Taylor, Naima McQueen, Jesus Nava, Susan Reynolds, Jean Seip, and Ken Stram. I would also like to thank our Gellert Fellows, Jacqueline Bovier copeland John Hutchinson, and Paul Terry. I wanna thank the Gellert event support team, Dr. Monica Hudson, director, Akia Amani, Gellert Center Research Assistant, BB events team, D-Stripe, and Potluck Consulting. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to acknowledge the Gellert Foundation and the Gellert family after whom our center is named including Gellert Foundation members, Jack Fitzpatrick, President and Executive Director, Andrew A. Cressy, Ken Flynn, Robert J. Cressy Jr., Michael J. King, Malcolm Visbell, Christine Whelan, and Rosa King, Program Officer. Now, I would like to invite Gellert Foundation President, Jack Fitzpatrick, to offer a few words. My name is Jack Fitzpatrick, as Leonard said, and I'm here this afternoon with a couple of my fellow directors, Bob Grisilli and Mike King. We want to congratulate this year's award winners, Miyako's Old Fashioned Ice Cream and Mendel's. These legacy businesses are just the type of companies that uh, the center's founder, Eugene Muscat, envisioned being acknowledged by USF, USF students in the community, which are San Francisco-based, long-time family-owned enterprises being handed down from one generation to the next. 
like you, the Gellerts formed a family business and they started as simple painters, but they grew it into a home building business in San Francisco and Northern San Mateo County. Like you, they built a strong business for providing a quality product to the customers and rewarding employees for their hard work. You follow on that legacy and we congratulate you. I and my fellow board members of the Geller Foundation are pleased with how our funding has been used over three, uh, over the last several years to expand the center's website, to shift to a membership role model and to honor businesses like the ones here this afternoon. We look forward to seeing something come of the center's future projects, including the Next Generation Institute, which will begin in September of 2021. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. And now back to you, Dr. Monica. Thanks so much, Jack. On behalf of the USF Gellard Family Business Center, I wanna thank all the people and organizations who made this award celebration possible. I'd like to thank Paula Harrell of Piharo Wines and my colleague, Tom Meyer. I wanna thank Father Paul Fitzgerald, president of USF and Dr. Charles Moses, Dean of the USF School of Management. Our 2019 awardees, Miyako Old Fashioned Ice Cream and Mendel's. I'd like to thank our Gellard Center event support team, including BB Events, Potluck Consulting, D-Stripe, Aki Ami, our research assistant, and our, the people who pay for this, our SOM finance team, including Morgan Mash and Blanca Delegado. I'd like to thank advisory board members and our Gellard Fellows, as well as the Carl and Cecilia Berta Gellard Foundation. I wanna thank all of you for coming. And I want to again ask you to note that in September, our Center's Next Generation Institute is going to be kicking off with a physical ceremony where our 2019 awardees will be formally presented with their awards and our 2021 awardees and their families will be formally photographed for theirs. If you have not already done so, please consider becoming a Center member. We have memberships suited for any size family firm. Our discount membership package ends today, so we encourage you to take advantage of it. And at a minimum, please sign up to receive our monthly informational materials via info at gellardfbc.org. Again, thank you and good evening.